Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm Dr. Haifa al Faridi, a pediatric endocrinologist from King Abdullah Specialized Children's Hospital in Riyadh. And it's my pre pleasure to introduce to you today Professor Karine de Beaufort, a consultant in pediatric diabetes and endocrinology from the Centre Hospitalier de, de Luxembourg. She's also president of the ESPAD. Um, Professor de Beaufort completed her MD and PhD in 1986 in Rotterdam, Netherlands. She then completed her pediatric training in the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and France in 1993, followed by training in pediatric endocrinology, diabetology in 1999. She also completed a university DU in public health in 1988 in Nancy, France, and participated in the Eurodiab Diabetes Registry. Professor de Beaufort participated in the creation of the multidisciplinary team, the DECCP, for the care of children and adolescents with diabetes in Luxembourg, a dynamic and international team. They've been recognized as a center of reference for pediatric diabetes, as well as a member of the European Reference Network for Rare Diabetes. She received several research grants from the EU into regional and international funding structures. Her research topics include epidemiology, technology in diabetes care, and the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. She has more than 140 publications in peer-reviewed journals and several, ch several chapters in books. Between 2012 and 2016, Professor de Beaufort was the Secretary General of ISPAD, and in that function, she was able to meet with many colleagues and patients around the globe, working on improving access to care and quality of care for young people with diabetes. It's our pleasure to have you here with us today, Professor de Beaufort. You'll be speaking to us about the use of technology in youth with type 1 diabetes. Uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Dear colleagues and friends, First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the meeting to invite me to give this presentation on the use of technology in the treatment of young people with diabetes. I'm Karine Beaufort. I'm located in Luxembourg, Europe, and I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. I have no, no specific disclosures except my uh, participation in the e-learning board for the Medtronic now, what would I like to address in my presentation? First of all, current situation, type one diabetes treatment in young people. And for that, I'll show you some of the data of the SWEET registry. And then of course, as well, the use in that population of technology. Finally, I would like to address uh, the patient perspective what are the ideas and the expectations of people with diabetes when they talk about technology, and what do we hope to achieve? Very important, I think, is to remind ourselves that we've got one treatment target in all age groups at all moments, which is a good metabolic control. ISPAD currently recommends, recommends an HbA1c below 7%, 53 millimolar per mole. Um, the WHO target is slightly higher, at least the objective is to meet this target in at least 80%, having an HbA1c below 8% or 64 millimolar per mole. Of course, this needs to be associated with a normal physical and psychosocial development, a good quality of life, and all in order to prevent acute and late complications. It's a package deal we need to go for. And essential for this is, of course, to have access to insulin, but as well to strips and to education to use it. I mean, you have to know uh, what the insulin is doing, what the insulin you use, what the profile is, how long is it acting? And you need to know what you're eating. Carb counting is a fixed part of our current treatment approach in our education. And there are so many different things interacting with the effect of the insulin be it stress, physical activity, intercurrent illnesses, hormonal changes, etc. Now, if you look at the use of technology in different pediatric age groups, and let's start with the smaller kids, the younger ones, um, you have to realize that for them to really obtain good metabolic control is extremely tough. And here I'm talking about the preschoolers, say kids below six, seven years of age. They've got small insulin doses because they are tiny, uh, which means shorter duration of insulin action. The injection sites 
are just age appropriate, which is small. Remission phase doesn't last very long in the younger kids, and they are very sensitive to insulin. So modification of half a unit or a unit may really have already an impact. And as parent, I think we are all aware of how important it is to have an overnight sleep. And if that one should be huh, over a certain number of hours, let's say eight to 10 hours, it's very difficult to cope without technology an appropriate um, effect of insulin during that time. Short action duration because you've got a small dose. Furthermore, the lifestyle of young kids is very unpredictable. They'll sh go playing when you don't expect them to, and they'll eat when you don't expect them to, or they won't eat when you expect them to. And then we have the frequent intercurrent infections, either by uh, daycare or just by their common environment. So in this population, this population is very difficult to obtain a good metabolic control with uh, injection therapy. Now, school and adolescents, uh, school children and adolescents are another population, but we are faced there as well with a number of problems in um, obtaining uh, or meeting our target of an HbA1c below 7. These unpredictable hypoglycemia, some of them have been solved, I think, by analyzing our continuous glucose monitoring profiles, but some still um, occur when we wouldn't expect them. Huge hormonal variations, sexual hormones, growth hormone, uh, early morning values frequently going up because you cannot increase the dose more without risking hypoglycemia around three, four o'clock at night which means that they've got high values in the morning. Extremely important in this age group is, of course, the role of the peer population. Their influence on lifestyle is highly important for young people and will exist whether we want it or not. This and hormonal changes very often leads to a change in metabolic control. And despite efforts, they really are doing efforts, might not always result in what we are trying to get. And this has an influence. I mean, if you continuously have a roller coaster blood glucose profile, you feel tired, you feel grumpy, you feel not the way you would like to feel. And then you get a discussion at home, you get a discussion in the clinic, fed up with bad results, make you sometimes just turn a page and say, I can't be bothered with it now and here. It is too difficult. And then, of course, on the other hand, because of physical symptoms, they sometimes may not be able to participate in the peer-related activities. And let's not forget, everybody is different. And here you've got a fantastic picture made during the dawn camp years ago by uh, the group in which Karen Langer, psychologist in Hanover participated. These are all different characters. We need to individualize. So I think there are a lot of challenges we are faced with when young people need to meet targets. Now, what's the current situation if we use different kinds of therapeutic approaches? I don't know whether you're aware of the SWEET registry. This is a global registry and all the dots represent centers somewhere around the globe who are participating and submitting their clinics data uh, in order to receive the report with benchmarking um, possibilities to compare your outcome, your treatment approach with those um, in the different other countries registered on this map. And you can see it's really a global registry in high income, middle income and low income countries. We now include over 80,000 patients in this registry. And here you can look at it afterwards, but definitely not if you would see it on a full screen. Uh, we would have 12, um, between 12 and 18 years, around almost 19,000 uh, persons. We've got data between 18 and 25 years, which as well belongs to, I think, young people, um, more than 6,500 and almost 1,600 in the population above 25. 
So it's a large number of people and the data which are included are real live data. This is not an intervention or something specific. It's just the data of all these clinics together. And here you would have the metabolic outcome and you can see that meeting targets, meeting ISPAT targets is still very limited. Below seven, we've got about 25% uh, in the zero to 18 years. And from that uh, percentage, it's not most often seen in the population between 12 and 18 years. It's only 22%. And 25% is over nine with this HbA1c. So no, we're not good enough as clinicians to support and educate the young people to obtain and meet treatment targets. Now, does the pump influence? Here you see in the same population, the outcome when people are using a pump or are not using a pump. And again, you can see that the percentage of young people using a pump between 12 and 18 is almost 29%. And there is a difference in HPA1C with or without a pump. Now, again, it's not yet meeting target, but there is a tendency to a lower value. And the same goes if you look at the population between 18 and 25 years. Above 25 years, treatment targets kind of approach what we really want to have, the 7.1. And you see that the difference with a uh, climbing age is getting more and more important, whether you use technology or not. So there seems to be an impact using pump, and here I'm talking about pump only. Glucose monitoring, I don't have outcome data yet, because you see that there is a huge change over time. And we've got now about 53% of the people using CGM. And in the next years, we definitely hope to analyze whether CGM alone or CGM with pump would have an impact on the metabolic control. So what can we conclude from the sweet data? We do not need target in over 70% of young people. Pump treatment shows a little bit of lower HPA1C. And we do see in the full population that there is a fast increase in the use of continuous glucose monitoring. But how should we move forward in order um, to meet targets and provide a better treatment for young people with diabetes? Of course, maybe we should look from an engineer point of view. This is a slide very kindly shared with uh, me through Dr. Andrea Scaramuzza from Cremona. And he was comparing it with a car. First of all, we had uh, the man who was taking all responsibilities for driving the car. The next step would be that part of the work is taking over. We've got the fixed speed with which we can drive and the information of a sensor, a glucose sensor, as you can see in the circle, is transmitted to the pump, but the pump is not doing anything more with it, except for potentially um, stopping insulin administration for a fixed period of time uh, to prevent hypoglycemia. But as we know, we shouldn't only prevent hypo, we should prevent as well the hyperglycemia. And this is something, of course, we would expect and which is now starting to become available with the automatic pilot, where indeed there is an algorithm who will um, steer insulin administration based on continuous input of glucose sensor values. How can this look? This can look like this. And here a model is the um, smart guard or the uh, Medtronic pump. But I think we still have quite a bumpy road in front of us. Probably we're going down the road. So we are progressing. And I think the road towards disclosing the loop, uh, definitely not always smooth, has moved from pump, CGM, uh, to the sensor augmented pump and now the hybrid closed loop and some studies on the fully closed loop. And um, having seen the whole development from 1982, where I started to use with pumps, started to use of pumps in young kids, um, I think 
it's a lot of progress. Is it enough? Is it already where we want to be? Um, let's have a look at what are different things and uh, the commercially available hybrid closed loop systems offer us by now. As you can see, there are different kinds of algorithms. And there is the um, algorithm where we've got a uh, the fuzzy logic. We've got the, the PID with the insulin feedback. And that's in the Medtronic pumps. We've got the MPC, the Cambridge algorithm. And we've got uh, the treat to range predictive algorithm, another, again, algorithm which has been developed in the tandem. So the different systems are Medtronic, two systems, CAM apps, and the control IQ from uh, the tandem. Very important, I think, uh, is as well to look at the different targets which you should achieve, whether it's fixed or not fixed. And I think we still need to have more longer time outcome before we can say what really would be the best way forward. So schematically uh, presented, the closed loop insulin delivery would be you get a glucose level, which is sensed by the CGM forwarded in a control algorithm to the insulin delivery, which again leads to the glucose level, etc. Very important to include here. Um, and what you can see as well in the FDI requirement, which has been published, I think it was 2013, for uh, the as regulatory criteria for an artificial pancreas, you need to evaluate and provide data on the continuous glucose monitoring, who should be reliable and appropriate computer controlled algorithm, the insulin pump, but as well on the human factor, what can happen and how does it work in real life in patients? And that will be one of the factors very important to uh, create a artificial pancreas system which can be used in a wider population. It would be very nice as well to have that very fast acting insulin. Now, young people, what would they expect? This is a Luxembourg group of young people with diabetes who are moving into the water, um, which was quite an experience and they did a brilliant job, of course. Now, what's the patient expectation from uh, the closing the loop or a hybrid closed loop? This is result, this, these are data from an online survey done by Catherine Barnard already some years ago with a lot of questions in a variable age group and a variable diabetes duration, almost 20 years in some, but you can see the duration was very, was quite variable. Some had pumps, some had CGM, some used it all the time. And that's of course quite an important point because it's very well documented now that if you use the CGM less than a certain time period, its effect is gonna be very limited. And if you would have say 50% of use of a CGM while you have a closed loop system. It's not worthwhile to use a hybrid closed loop system. You really should use it over 90%, if not, if possible, almost 100. Now, why would these people use a pump or, an, sorry, an artificial pancreas, a hybrid closed loop system? And here you see the wish they would have to get that blood glucose level in a range, no roller coaster anymore. Less hypo and hyperglycemia, the variation in glycemic values, the variability is a massive problem. Less worry, the anxiety around low values, whether it is for a child or whether it is for yourself. Sleep better. Sleep is a really, and sleep dep deprivation, a really important point to consider when you talk about changes in insulin treatment and less interference with daily life. That's something finally what has been demonstrated as well in a later study published by Garza and colleagues, where they were looking at different perceptions, ideas, reflections and expectations around um, uh, the insulin delivery systems. And they were looking at um, human versus system expectations, technology, the glycemic control, the trust people would have in a system, confidence to use it, control it would take over. The night times, what happens with relationships if you've got another uh, device with you? 
and um, also the context in living with diabetes and these hybrid closed uh, loop systems? Would it change quality of life? What would be the features you would consider important? What would be the concerns and what would you expect to be the burden of the system? And of course, not negligible, not to be uh, put aside is the financial impact. So what did they find? For them, um, they one of the themes they addressed showed that one of the expected outcome would be that there would be in life less discussion about diabetes and more about life, and that it would decrease the stress of the families. And the hope would be that once again, less burden on the person with diabetes, but also less levels of stress within the family. And not yes, you would still have some carb counting and bolusing, um, but it would be less um, imposing attention uh, around meals on this. Have you done your control? Have you done your injection, etc.? And they thought it would be as well something which would have improved uh, effect on the quality of life uh, of the relationships uh, of the family and within the family, reduction of the conflicts around all the daily self-care tasks you have when you are dealing with diabetes. And it can influence your mood. Um, having that roller coaster blood glucose values where you have the feeling to have no control on really influences your mood. So closed loop system, they expect more sleep, less burden, less manipulation with the system. Uh, and of course, less injections because you would have a catheter placed and you would have a sensor measuring continuously. Yes, you have to change them, but there is a difference with four to six injections per day and a change of a catheter between three and four days. More flexibility. Um, if there is a continuous insulin and a basal administration covered, whether you eat at seven, eight or nine, it might not have the same impact. And it would be less complex because you only have got one insulin and variation is partially dealt with. Less calculation, less consideration of everything, uh, what has happened. It won't take over everything, but it will influence a lot of these. But, of course, every positive has as well some negative or points to consider. And one thing is certainly the alarms. In many of the systems, you can't stop the low glucose alarm. And you can put a strict higher glucose alarm or not. But getting all the times these alerts and alarms can be leading to an alarm fatigue and to not wanting to be bothered anymore. You've got continuous information, which you have to realize can be quite bothersome and tiring. You see, you've got something you can see on the outside that you've got diabetes, which for young people is not always acceptable. You're depending on the device, which you should consider as well, because if the catheter is out, you have no insulin, fast acting insulin, short and remaining quantity of insulin, so your values go up. And you need to take all the time, all the stuff with you in order to be able to put a new catheter in and, um, and so on and so forth. Some people are afraid of devices and devices taking over their life. And of course, every device and every connection can fail and can at that time point lead to no insulin admin at all. And then very important to consider, already mentioned by, jo, uh, by Joseph in 2.13, uh, we're using the skin for all of this. And we need to realize that the skin uh, needs to be well preserved in order to allow appropriate insulin administration and effect and resorption or resorption and effect. Because if we've got local skin reactions or allergies, that really might influence the resorption of insulin if already it is acceptable to continue use that specific catheter or sensor with the plaster it has. But on the positive side, sleeping because of the different devices is something extremely highly valued. This is not a young person. This is a very young person. 
because for this population, we didn't have yet any approved uh, combined um, closed loop systems. And you can see this is the CAMAPS with on the phone algorithm, but as well, you can see the continuous uh, glucose monitoring outcome. There is a small pump. You don't have to manipulate a lot because you will do all insulin administration for meals through the, the mobile phone. And you can see his face. And here you can see the values in this young person before closing the loop, which were not bad at all. You see the very flat on the lower graph, the very flat uh, basal rate, I hope. And the upper graph shows you the, the glucose value of the Dexcom. This is uh, two o'clock change towards the closed loop. You see uh, how diverse and variable the insulin administration gets with moments of nothing and moments uh, of up to three units. So very important variation and an excellent impact on the glucose values. About 20% basal, a mean value of 135, and you can see that uh, variations remain, but the outcome is really very positive. It led to a lot more sleep of the families, which was something the parents were extremely happy with. And certainly in these young kids, I can tell you all parents cried from happiness when they could continue to use the system after the research project. Now, what's the future going to be? And we're going back now to the young people and not the very young children. I think for the very young children, use of technology should be advised wherever it's available and possible. Now, in the future, we would expect uh, that the outcome improves, metabolic outcome with a more time and range. I think that's definitely something which is more informative even if we have to learn in the next years about uh, its impact as a surrogate marker on the long-term complications. First data start to come, but we have not a DCCT using time and range. We'll get there. Uh, HbA1c, of course, you expect it to remain in the normal range. And of course, less or no increase, at least, in hypoglycemia. And I think that's something we, at least in our experience, do see um, at all levels when we use the hybrid closed loop. It should have as well the psychological benefit uh, because uh, using a treatment only to get a better metabolic control, which would render the people very unhappy, is not something which is going to be uh, sustainable. It can maybe be used then in a short period of time or to test something, but that's not going to be real life in the long term. But so far, most closed loop said Close, closing hybrid closed loop systems do provide a better quality of life, better sleep, and reduction of hypoglycemia fear. And this is something we observe in the 780, as well, of course, in that come up um, use. Too early to talk about the chronic complications. And I think we really need to consider with the different um, studies which are ongoing whether we can consider that it will have a long-term economic impact, which I would expect it to have, but thinking is and, and, and expecting is one thing you need, hard facts. And furthermore, very important, of course, we need to see how we can get access for these uh, tools for those who might benefit. Uh, not forgetting to get robust long-term data, we also should consider how can we increase access? So if we discuss technology and the current situation in young people, um, there's definitely a lot of work still to be done. In most young people, we do not meet targets. When we use technology, it's getting better, but it's not good enough. We now need to look whether we really get improved outcome when they use the hybrid closed loops. And with respect to future expectation, partially these are met and further we need to do for new and more investigation. So there is definitely hope, but we shouldn't sit and wait. We should try to continue to move forward. When should we start technology in young people? 
I think it depends on the setting of the clinic and on the family. Would it be at onset? It would be my preference, but I know that uh, in our unit in the, uh, at onset, we only start with the very young children directly with pump and CGM and when we can with um, closed the hybrid closed loop, not in the older group, but I wonder whether we shouldn't. I think it depends on the team. You really need to uh, work in collaboration with the family and uh, the person with diabetes and see whether he or she wants to use technology to get a good metabolic control or prefers the conventional um, injections, knowing that it's going to be at least four to six injections per day. But I think we have to remain dogmatic about outcome, not about the approach. I don't think for the moment we've got anything which is perfect. Some things seem easier than others, but we have to individualize. Then what age group? I think young children, definitely we need to go and get um, technology as soon as possible because it's impossible to do it in, uh, or almost impossible. Nothing is impossible, but it's far more challenging and difficult if you have to uh, provide good uh, diabetes care and meet targets when it's going to be with um, injection therapy. Of course, you have to look at the family structure and you have to individualize. And certainly for young people, you have to consider their ideas, what they consider an extra or a lesser burden. And sometimes we might be surprised, but their view is going to be essential to include in the treatment we're going to propose them to use. And once again, it needs to be teamwork. And within the team, there needs to be a uh, confidence in the use of a technology and also a wish to use it and to educate it because education is going to be key. And then, of course, you can question what kind of technology. Should it be only the pump? Should it be only uh, the continuous glucose monitoring? Um, and some people also say maybe as technology is going to come and hybrid closed loop is approaching but we won't wait. We will individualize according to our needs, uh, the systems which are on the market. And there will be within the next month, I guess, a um, very good review paper from uh, written, first of all, by persons with diabetes who have uh, put in place a do-it-yourself or their own closed loop system. And uh, I think it's extremely interesting to see their reflection, uh, which is very well balanced on positive uh, points and potential risks. So in summary, technology in young people, we need to discuss access to it so that it's everywhere at a worldwide level there for those who need it and who want it. We need to consider human factors. Not everybody is the same and we should treat to target, individualize. Not all young people will be happy with technology and other people will be indeed preferring uh, technology on uh, all other options. Education is gonna be key, whether it's education of the systems or education of diabetes. It's gonna be central in any kind of treatment approach. It needs to be teamwork and you need to have a 24 seven hotline. And nothing can be do, done if you don't have a team you work with. And I'm very grateful to the team that may that they helped me in all the work we've done on technology and more important, diabetes care of every day. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor de Beaufort, for this fascinating presentation. Um, we're going to move on to the question and answer section. Um, the first question is, about your experience with the open source systems, like the do-it-yourself do systems. What uh, experience do you have about that? What advice do you have for us if we encounter a patient who's using that kind of technology? Thank you very much for that question. Very interesting. And I think we are evolving. If you would have asked me this five years ago, I probably would have said, oh, help. And uh, please let me advise patients against it. I think for the moment that in those, we've got several parents uh, who have started this, 
And if you look at the outcome, it's incredible. It's impressive. And I think that they um, managed to do an, ex an excellent job. It is, of course, a system for the individual. You need to have parents who are able to cope with it. And I think this is all very well reflected in the review paper, which I hope will come out within the next months uh, and definitely look for it because you've got the legal aspects which are not covered. But on the other hand, you see brilliant results from persons with diabetes for themselves or for their uh, children. Thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, what should be our approach towards syndromic obesity in children? Should we focus on bariatric surgery or are there some therapies targeting the hypothalamus? Uh, I think there was an excellent talk uh, before by Khalid uh, Hussain on this uh, perspective. I definitely think that we should look at that what's on uh, getting available now, and there are new drugs in development and new drugs developed, like the melanotide, like, and there are some other ones who are now being evaluated. Uh, bariatric surgery, I think uh, the verdict is still out uh, because the results might be um, very short or, yeah, we might buy time on one hand, but is that enough? looking at all the complications and we shouldn't underestimate the psychological impact of bariatric surgery. And there are some long-term studies in young people um, who are not that favorable, at least with respect to uh, psycho psychological status. So there are definitely therapies coming, um, but uh, we need to be careful. And I think we definitely need to screen where we can. Thank you. I think our last question is, uh, how can we reduce insulin dose in obese children with diabetes? I think the first thing we need to consider is why are they obese? Is it because they're trying to be too clever with their insulin and overdosing? Are they hungry because we overdose? And based on that, uh, need, they need to eat. And sometimes I'm surprised. And that's, again, probably in all the answers I should give today, we need to partner with our patients and understand what really is happening. And I can go on a whole evening in how brilliant parents can manipulate pumps. And if you don't really ask um, and go through the data, you will not understand how they are managing something. And uh, recently, because Luxembourg is regretfully belonging to the more obese population, or at least our population is, and uh, recently in some very, um, uh, in children with a very high BMI and diabetes, we combined it with uh, liraglutide. Uh, and that gave a very good result. Uh, first of all, not to reduce the insulin dose, but to reduce the obesity. And through that, say when you reduce insulin resistance because you've got the mixed form, but it is interesting, um, interesting sport. It's the, for the moment, the last uh, resort, which we are looking for, but um, it seems to work. Are you going to be publishing that data anytime soon? I don't think so because it's still anecdotal. There are some data published, I think from probably the US where they're faced with this problem even more than we are. Um, but um, uh, presenting as case reports, yes, but it's not enough to, to publish. Thank you so much, Professor de Beaufort. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, and I look forward to meeting you in other conferences. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. <laughs>